Welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day. Find out what it takes to truly discover what it takes to elevate your career within payroll as we meet with the industry leaders who are shaping the industry for tomorrow. Hello and welcome everyone to June's edition of Payroll Question Time. Now, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nick Day. I'm host of the Payroll Podcast, host of this wonderful show, Payroll Question Time. I'm a member of Award 300 and founder of JGA Recruitment, which is a specialist payroll recruitment company. Uh, it's probably enough about me. I would rather introduce you to our wonderful panel. So going from my view, from left to right, I'm going to start with Simon Parsons. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. But uh, it's good to be with you again on another. That We must be going for two and a half years now, isn't it, of uh, Peril Question Time. So Director of UK Compliance Strategies for SD Work, so dealing with compliance payroll, HR solutions, and closely monitoring uh, what HMRC are up to and some of the other government departments. Next, I'd like to introduce you all to Rachel Giles. Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me back again. Third uh, PQT. Very pleased to be here. I work for DWF. We are a global law firm. I work as an associate in the employment team. We have offices all over the UK and Ireland and all over the world. So if you do have any specific employment law questions following this call, please do get in touch. I'd be happy to help or steer you in the right direction. And last but not least, our newest panel member, Samantha Johnson. Hello, everyone. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Sam Johnson, Payroll Services Director at Danes Accountants. Previously, as Nick said, worked for the CIPP as the policy lead. So started to get involved in sort of webinars and, and events a little bit like this. So couldn't resist Nick's invitation when he invited me to be part of the panel. So for now, let's jump into today's discussion areas. Uh, we're going to start today with the NI thresholds changes. We're going to move over to the holiday pay pitfalls and some things to really think about here. So do keep your notes and the handbooks and things ready. Cost of living and wage inflation and some hot topics to get through as well. So let's jump into our first subject for today, which is going to be talking about NI threshold changes. Uh, let's start with the uh, the facts of the uh, of the matter, maybe with yourself, Simon, some of the changes that take effect from the 6th of July. Yeah, sure. So um, Rishi Sunak announced in a spring statement on the 23rd of March that the increases in national insurance, which were effective from 6th of April, would be rolled backwards a little bit as far as employees are concerned to help assist with the cost of living. Now, there's been some speculation on some aspects of this because um, there'd be an element of why wasn't this started on the 6th of April, but I'm sure we'll develop that as we go and discuss around. The facts of the matter is that the weekly primary threshold was set at £190 per week, has increased now to 242 So the point at which employees um, start paying national insurance contributions has significantly jumped by £52. For two weekly paid people, 380 is now 484 Four weekly, £760 is £967. And for monthly, £823 was the primary threshold for a monthly, is now £1,048, which in effect lines itself with the taxation sort of starting points. So the interesting other aspect is that this commences on the 6th of July. So the 6th of July just happens to coincide with tax week 14. That sits nicely for weekly paid fortnightly paid and monthlies for four weekly paid or lunar pay monthlies it's a little bit odd because it'll all depend on the pay day and not the tax period because normally the tax period would be tax period 16 but the whether the new thresholds are used or not is dependent on the date of payment declared to HMRC as being the contract date so if it's on the 5th of July you use the old threshold. If it's on the 6th of July or after, you use the new threshold. So you may have some thinking, oh, maybe we should delay payday a day or two, or make sure we're the right side of the four weekly cycle so that it uh, uh, benefits the employees. Don't know, that's probably a discussion that should have been had a couple of months ago, but there is potentially still time. Is that a good uh, starting point? The other aspect is, is the annual for directors is different. So the annual for employees is based on 12,570, but they'll have a period of, because they're not paid annually generally, 
they're paid in bits. For a director, the annual is 11908, so 11,908 pounds, no matter when. Again, before the 6th of July, a director will be calculated on the old basis of 9,880 pounds. But from the 6th of July onwards, it'll be recalculated back to April at 11,908. Super. Now, presumably, Samantha, when you're managing multiple client payrolls, as you are at Danes, this is obviously had a going to have quite a big impact. So why now? What, what's your view on, the, on why they've, they've brought this, these changes in now? <laughs> view on why now is, I suppose, an interesting one. Obviously, it, it was announced late in the day in March, and we always do push back on, on late changes and have done, with the exception of furlough, for, for a number of years within payroll. Personally, I would have liked to have seen this come in in April. It does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable that there are in-year changes going on with NI thresholds. And this is something that has, as I well, certainly not been uh, within my working career. I think the last time was in either the 70s or 80s that, that there was an NI threshold change mid-year. It makes it really difficult to communicate that because it's just completely outside of the norm. It's a complete anomaly. So helping people understand that, helping clients understand that and employees in the payroll understand that, create has and will create a challenge going forward i suppose the exception to that is that it's it's a nicer challenge to have because what's happening is they're seeing an increase in their net pay so unlike the impact that it had in april when the ni rates went up this will have, a, have the opposite where people are less inclined to call the payroll teams when they see the increase in net pay and i have also seen a lot of linkedin posts recently about the new hmrc gov.uk calculator, which shows you if you're better off or worse off with the new rates, uh, new thresholds and the new rates combined in this tax year. So why now, like I say, my personal viewpoint, wish it was April, but at least it's the nicer argument to have they've got more money and not less. Absolutely, especially with the cost of living, which we'll get to for everybody going up. But I'm, I'm going to, have to come back to Simon because I saw a smirk come across his face when he said 70s or 80s, and I suspect Simon knows the exact year when this last <laughs> happened. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you, Simon, and put you on the spot here. Was that why you had a dry smile? Well, yeah, I was thinking I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, am I? Um, maybe I am. So I'm, I'm still looking very young. But uh, I do remember a change. I think it was probably in the late 80s or the, or the early 90s where we had a change apply from October, so October the 6th. But uh, some significant time ago, uh, to me, it still seems like the other year. But I guess when you reflect back, that was 30 years ago. Yeah, days of, uh, of a lot more manual based processing as well. So it's, it sticks yes. in the mind. But what's, what, what do we need to do in relation to backdated corrections then? Is this something we're going to need to be, be aware of going forward? Well, yeah, I mean, developing some of the conversation that uh, Sam was there, uh, the, there's an element of having, be careful a little bit what I say, having been involved in some of the early consultations, sometimes it's implied that the delay was somehow the software industry's fault, whereas the original consultation, the 6th of April, was never offered as an option. Mm. I'm not saying the 6th of July was either. So there was an element of it was always going to be a two hit year rate. And so there is an element of actually, if it had been 6th of April, we'd have just got to it when we could and backdated and corrected everything. But it would have been a single calculation. That had been fairly straightforward. But the proposal was always a double calculation. Well, to go from a single to a double is quite a lot of activity. So that's quite some effort. So, um, yeah, it's interesting where we go. But that does mean we have to be careful because, of course, people will get paid the wrong amounts in June. There'll be backdated corrections in July, uh, et cetera, or various other things that are anomalies that are found later in the year. What do you do about corrections? Because how is your software geared up? What will you do? Because if you're correcting June's pay or May or April, the old threshold applies. And of course, if you're applying it now, the new threshold applies. So there is a pretty much an element of um, just be careful with backdated corrections and how you're handling them because yeah. uh, they may fall under different thresholds. There's a couple of things that I'd definitely say were worthwhile to do, which is go and go and get yourself really confident that all your NI categories are correct now. It doesn't mean that that will resolve any backdated issues, but it, at least you have that level of confidence now. 
and talk to your software provider and make sure that you really understand how they've implemented this change so that you know if you do need to make any corrections, you've, you've already got a guide and you don't have to panic when it comes up. I have a quick chat, Simon, about the impact on the NI thresholds change on the health and social care levy. Probably very little, but I think this, uh, this was probably there for thinking to the future. And, and so we'll have all gone through and changed our various general ledgers, costing interface files to think that the, uh, the employer side doesn't change, but the employee side does. Uh, and we've uplifted everything by the 1.25% health and social care levy, which is brilliant. So we've now changed everything to handle that additional amount. But as far as national insurance is concerned, from next 6th of April, it goes away again. So it doesn't exist. So the 1.25 disappears off, but it doesn't disappear as an employer cost because it's now its own taxation in its own right. And we're yet to see what the calculations will be, the formula for April 2023. So this year is a bit of a fudged year from uh, HMRC side to the extent that the health and social care levy has been lumped in. And so we've ended up with the special message on our payslip pretty pretty please it's not compulsory it's not law that you have to but you're asked if you would produce that message it's also on the personal tax account a note the challenge with that one nick potentially is who else is wanting to go and have payslip messages put on when these were really for the employer to use to communicate with employees not for all and sundry next it'll be sort of remember to order six eggs and get a <laughs> pint of milk on the way home don't know is, is it going to be that sort of thing plus the other angle on payslip messaging which is um i don't know is probably even worse asking the panelists when did you last look at a paper payslip or uh, or that sort of area all I'd look at is the net pay amount on a app. And yeah. assuming that looks okay, I'm quite happy. I don't go around looking for messages, but uh, it seems a bit of an antiquated type uh, means of thinking, oh, why don't you just put it on people's personal tax account? But what will we get next? We'll get Northern Ireland Assembly wanting to put messages, Scottish Parliament, will we? We'll get Welsh Assembly maybe. Um, we'll get the local council. Interesting times ahead. Well, we've got three questions already that have come in. So thank you, everyone, for being Fantastic. involved. Keep them coming to me. I'm going to start the first question for yourself, Samantha. So your first ever question being posed to you on PPT is this. Has the rules uh, of the P45 changed in the last month? Um, so if a new starter starts in June and submitted the P45 in July, should we continue to process the earnings in payroll if they are still on 0T tax code? Or do we wait until the HMRC sends through the RTI and updates the tax code and earnings? Yeah, so this was in the agent update, I believe. Um, well, I think there's something we were going to talk about, actually. I think it's on a future slide, but that's fine. Yeah, it was in the age of agent update from June, and they've confirmed that, yes, you no longer need to apply the P45 if it's outside of that initial payment processing period. So if you get it in time for the new starter, absolutely apply it as you normally would. Once you've notified them with that new starter declaration instead, once you've notified HMRC, then you do not need to apply the P45 unless it has a student loan. So it's still worth a look because obviously that little Y in the box still tells us that we need to start those deductions. So you would need to action them. Super. And obviously stay tuned. In fact, we're going to be covering this in more detail a bit later on in the show as well. Uh, next question is one for you, Simon, comes in from Simon Briggs. And it says, my employer is thinking about implementing annual season ticket loans for employees. Are there any tax or NIC liabilities to be aware of for both EES and ERS? Thanks. Employees and employees. Principally, no. So um, it's just a standard employer provided loan. And as long as it's under the £10,000 uh, limit, there is no tax and NI implication. Now, there's an element of thinking, are you thinking of doing it via other means? So this sounds to me like a traditional season ticket loan. Uh, absolutely no issues with it. The recovery amount is from net pay so after tax national insurance so it doesn't reduce anything on a season ticket loan and equally it's not treated as uh, a benefit as long as the uh, average balance of the loan doesn't exceed ten thousand pounds okay super oh questions coming in thick and fast now which we like so fantastic uh, 
next question comes from Ian. It says, I'll over to you, back to you, Sam. Hopefully it's a, an easy one based on, on the relevant uh, slide here on my threshold. It says, can you just confirm if we underpaid an employee in May and are paying them the arrears in July, we would still be okay to use the new NI thresholds for all of their July pay, including the arrears? Yes, that's your sort of standard NI approach, isn't it? You, it's the pay period in which you're making the payment is the relevant one. So you wouldn't go back and recalculate. What you would do if there was a overpayment, however, is you would go back and recalculate the NI based on the old thresholds if you were correcting for that reason. But for an underpayment, no, it's based on when the payment is just paid to the employee. And this is where um, contract situations are usually quite useful because you have to take a little care. Because if it's viewed that the money was contractually due in the past, you may have an obligation to recalculate and that impacts pensions, student loan, attachment of earnings orders, earnings arrestment. But the general principle, which is where Sam's coming from, is that most people will state that any back payment or correction is due at the point it was corrected, not historically. So there's an element of uh, importance sometimes on wording. But generally, uh, you know, it's at the point of payment as exactly as Sam says. And last but not least uh, for you, Simon, as comes in from Kerry, if I need to correct the apprenticeship levy declared in a previous tax year, do I simply submit a revised EPS? And the answer to that is uh, yes, although I'm um, having a number of reports of the EPS having changed since April. So, for example, if someone forgot to file the EPS, you simply went back and filed it. So you can do that certainly for previous tax years, as far as I'm aware. I have to go and check it again but you can adjust the EPS for a prior tax year. Sometimes there's an element of, oh, I've missed the May EPS submission, and it's now after the 19th of June. Can I submit the EPS? The BPT at the moment is saying, no, you can't because you're too late, which is new, didn't used to do that. But you can submit the June or, or the July submission relating to June with the right values and then send a replacement as long as you do it on time. It seems very strange and weird design that the HMRC are applying here, but I think in an attempt to enforce deadlines. Then we're going to jump into the next uh, slide, which is all about holiday pay pitfalls. And uh, there were a couple of um, things that came into the news around this, which I thought was quite interesting. The threats, which unfortunately where some of their team members received pay on the Monday rather than the Thursday that week. And it's worth reassuring that they did ensure that financial support was offered to any team member who needed it at that time. So I think it was covered and anyone, no one was actually out of pocket in the end. But it was, I think it highlighted a couple of points for us to discuss on today's show, really. So um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, holiday pay pitfalls we need to avoid. Uh, let's start with yourself, Simon. Yeah. OK, so the, the pretty issue was generally with the payment, wasn't it? And so it's a general thing, not necessarily relating to holiday, but caused by the previous bank holidays to the extent that they meant to pay their staff the day before the Jubilee celebrations occurred. They missed the payment submission time and so paid them on the Monday after. And so that caused a bit of a rumpus uh, around for, for employees, especially if they had commitments. And it's a general principle on where bank holidays and weekends fall, be careful with your pay dates and also be careful with the date you report to HMRC because it can impact employees' entitlement to universal credit and when they see that things are fitting. So sometimes I think we have in our mind, it has to be the payday, it has to be the payday, but on the F, PS, it, has to, it should really be the contractual payday, not the actual payday. Otherwise, employees are impacted quite badly. I guess the other aspect of uh, bank holidays is, uh, well, actually, statutorily wise, there is no right to pay bank holidays. So that becomes a contract matter. I, mean, I thought I'd probably relate to similar challenge some years ago with a Pret Monge concern where a major hospital trust uh, managed to fail their backs deadline so everybody was paid a few days late. The uh, payroll manager there at the time, this is, this is going back 20 years, managed to get the pay bill invested on the overnight financial markets. Those days the rates which we seem to be returning to were much higher than they of course they historically have been so you don't get much return. And they settled all of the claims of any of the employees who got bank charges as a result of difficulties. Um, at the end of the day, they made a profit. 
So the bank charge settlement was less than the investment return on the overnight investment markets. I can say that's probably unusual, but I guess they were probably anticipate the claims would have been more than they were. But I think some of the banks were very forgiving. Whether that would happen these days or not, or the only interest you'd have got on the overnight market was probably about 37 pence. But yeah, let's talk about some of the other things. So there have been a couple of other cases recently and holiday law rulings are sort of ones where we think we know how the dice lay on the floor. So we've got the score and then it looks like a judge or, or some panel has picked them up and just rethrown them. And now there are different numbers. And I don't know if that's how Rachel feels about this, but the one that's um, uh, sort of brought some angst is the Pimlico Plumbers case. Uh, I mean, Pimlico Plumbers, uh, to a certain extent, have been a bit naughty and originally were denying any of their employees were entitled to any holiday because, of course, they're all self-employed. But a uh, former ruling ruled that they weren't self-employed and actually they were workers, or if they were self-employed, they were workers also, so were entitled to 5.6 paid weeks leave of holiday and of course we had some workers that took a case and in this case a heating engineer claimed he was owed holiday pay which counted to some uh, quite significant sum of money I think it was in the £70,000 sort of area for a number of years and Pimlico Plumbers kind of said no 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 you're out of time so if we remind ourselves what the backdating requirement is, is if you feel you've been underpaid holiday pay as an individual, I have three months to make a claim. If I don't do it within three months, I'm too late. And then if you do make within the three months, it then looks at three month gaps going backwards to find if they link and each of those are underpaid if they're shown to be underpaid. But if there's more than a three month gap, it stops. And that was limited to a two year backlog. Now, the case for Pimlico Plumbers is they're trying to claim that that backstop applied to these workers. But I think the, the ruling is tend to go along the line of, but you never gave them any holiday. That's the point in that case as well. It links to King and Sash Windows, which a similar case. So the, the self-employed person was deemed to be a worker. But in King and Sash Windows, he wasn't given the time off and he wasn't paid for it whereas in Smith and Pimlico plumbers he actually took the time off but he wasn't paid for it so that was the difference however the court of appeal the judge lady justice similar in that case has found that if a worker takes unpaid leave when the employer disputes the right and refuses to pay for the leave the worker is not exercising the right to paid leave. So it, it's a really, really interesting case. And I don't know whether I'm just going to actually read out the most important section in this case, the judgment at paragraph 100. I'm just going to read that out because I think it's very important for everyone on this call to understand. So a worker can only lose the right to leave at the end of the leave year. So this is the point about accruing to the following year. In a case where the right is disputed and the employer refuses to remunerate it, when the employer can meet the burden of showing it specifically and transparently gave the worker the opportunity to take paid leave, encouraged the worker to take paid annual leave and informed the worker that the right would be lost at the end of the leave year. If the employer cannot meet that burden, the right does not lapse but carries over and accumulates until termination of the contract, at which point the worker is entitled to a payment in respect of the untaken leave. Very, very complex. However, in summary, you really must, this, this is a worrying decision for the gig economy because leave can be carried over until termination. So it could go back all the way to, to when the work has started. But you really must inform your staff about the leave 
encourage them to take the leave and make sure you tell them if they don't take the leave at the end of that year they'll lose it in summary it's again and i always bang this drum communication to staff just inform staff that they have an amount of leave they need to take it and it can't be rolled over one question for you rachel that just brings yeah. to my mind this is clearly stipulated in an employment contracts. Is the burden still on the employer to remind them verbally and communicate again and again that they have this leave? Or should it, is that, you know, then owners go on to the employee, they should understand their own employment contracts? Particularly if it's workers, yes. And this, this applies to this, they call it the statutory leave, the four weeks leave. So, yes, employers should be encouraging staff to take leave if they want to avoid liability for, for significant holiday back play claims. Just having in a contract and relying on that isn't necessarily enough. He's, he's been more proactive. I would say so, yeah. Just one comment. I won't give away the uh, the employer in this comment, but interestingly, I think one of the 18% in that poll, someone has put a, it's not a question, it's just a point uh, in, in the chat box to say, uh, unfortunately, we did not get an extra day off, but we were allowed to take a holiday day for the Jubilee. It's something. <laughs> Yes, uh, unusual one, isn't it? Well, the Regulation 13A limits the full entitlement to 28 days as a statutory. Of course, an employer can do more, but there was no actual legal obligation to increase. However, some of us have contracts that will say we'll get bank holidays as well. Uh, and that would infer the extra day because the contracts worded that way. But uh, interesting. But some have voluntarily given it, even when it wasn't due. But I know some haven't. Yeah, yeah. But the, so, the other aspect of the Pimlico case is, of course, lots of employers have worried that actually the longevity claim point is now extended by the ruling where they did pay holiday pay, but not sufficient under the yeah. current rules. And there's an element of does that carry or not? It's unknown. It's untested. We, we don't know on that point. Interestingly, in Pimlico, um, Lord Justice Simla in Obiter, which means it, it's not binding, but it, it's we should take it into account. She agrees with the Northern Irish case, the Agnew case, in terms of the, the three month gap. So that's that's an interesting point as well, because in that case, they found that the three month gap didn't break the series of underpayments of wages. So that's yes. different to, to Bear Scotland, which is the three month or more breaks the chain. It's yes. one to watch. It is. And that was against, uh, what was that, Chief Constable of Police Service of Northern Ireland versus Agnew uh, in yeah. 2019. So it's just interesting. So we have this statutory limitation, but this case went against it for the reasons it gives. Uh, does that affect others? I think at the moment, you know, we, there's the definite impact on, on the gig economy that's undisputable. But you're right, it's that slippery slope argument, isn't it, with anything with Lloyd? How far does this go and how far does this impact? And, you know, there, there will be a lot of employers out there because of the complexity of holiday pay that may find themselves underpaying, knowingly or unknowingly, for a variety of reasons. And I think, it, is it then that that, that Bear Scotland rule in that series of deductions and the three month rule? no longer applies to underpayments as well as unpaid holiday. And that that's something I sort of definitely put a question mark over when I, I looked at the judgment here, because I just, it, it feels like that may be coming next, if if that's the next sort of tribunal claim. That... I mean, Rachel said it, the employer needs to communicate more clearly, but is that for payroll departments who, are, who know how much holiday has been taken? Is it for them to make that? Is it for HR? Is it for the you know, the stakeholders, you know, who's going to take the responsibility for reminding employees of, of the unused yeah. holiday they haven't used? Is it their direct line managers and so on and so forth? So there's an internal question to have there as well to see whether it's, yeah. it's this bit. Well, this is where it uh, sometimes breaks down a little bit, and we have it on some other aspects in payroll. I'll call it payroll for the moment, but I'll call it HR plus business. So sometimes this perception of some of these laws are a payroll problem. It's perceived that way, but in reality, they're not. They're an employment yeah. problem. Payroll is yeah. just dealing with the payment, and holiday is one of them. So payroll doesn't really understand entitlement. 
it, what it might understand is how much to pay. Entitlement yeah. is an employment matter, and we get the same with national minimum wage. So often they'll say national minimum wage is an payroll matter. Well, how does the payroll know you made them come in 15 minutes before and kept them back half an hour after? It doesn't because you didn't tell them that time. So it's not a payroll matter. It's a business matter which involves the working practices of the management and the staff, HR, and payroll only deal with the payment aspect. And quite often minimum wage breaches are not for the payment aspect, they're for the fact that you didn't record everything worked. And I think the same is the same with holiday, is actually how does the payroll know what the entitlements are? Because that's something else that's relating to contract. So it gets difficult. We had the other case, which has probably caused a little bit of confusion as well more recently, which is the D Perkins Best Connections Group Limited. But on that one, because we get an element of what's the basis of entitlement, and entitlement is generally on the basis of how long you've been employed not how much work you've done. But in the case of D Perkins and Best, the contract was drawn that he was only actually considered to be a worker when on assignment, but was in receipt of furlough. Now, all the government furlough guidance would imply that when someone's on holiday, you have to pay them full pay. But of course, un under his contractual arrangement, where if he wasn't working, he wasn't considered to be a worker. And I think the courts kind of found in that favour on that construction. The challenge with all of these things is they're all different to the specific yeah. circumstance. So sometimes we can jump on and think, oh, because of this case, that applies to me, when absolutely it's different yeah. and doesn't. So it's understanding the circumstances of all these cases. Building on your point from earlier, Simon, about, you know, payroll not necessarily having visibility of a lot of what's going on in the operation. I do think that that is, particularly in in-house payroll, a real call for a reason why payroll needs to sit at a more senior level. Because if, if payroll does have visibility in that way, then they can join up those conversations because I think, you know, your average sort of manager working in, in whatever industry and in whatever area are going to have lots of other things that they're going to be worried about and needing to do. And I think strategically manage a lot of these risks that they probably aren't even aware of. They are just assuming it's somebody else's problem. And it's joining up that thinking by having payroll at that more strategic level, I think. Yeah, Sam, I, com I completely agree with that point. You know, payroll, often that is where the small grievances will start at payroll level, which are just pay queries, the odd pay query that escalates into potentially a grievance, potentially a whistleblowing, potentially a discrimination matter, and that will end up at tribunal. So all working together, that is the only way that you're going to prevent claims. So yeah, I'd like to see that as well. We have two cases which are kind of binding, but under appeal, which also confuses it. So we have the Flowers versus East of England Ambulance Service, where over time, if you pay it, it's included in holiday. In effect, is um, summarising that very briefly. That's subject to uh, hearing hasn't actually even been heard at the Supreme Court yet no. on that one, but it's going to the Supreme Court. And we've got the Harbour Trust versus Brazil, which kind of impacts zero hours contracts, term time workers, uh, and anyone that was using an accrual basis based on a percentage, which the Court of Appeal in effect said they're unlawful. Uh, yeah. However, that, that's difficult because up until, I'll say, October 2019, at a guess from memory, uh, if you looked at ACAS on how to calculate holiday for these people, it'd tell you, oh, well, just take their pay or whatever and, and multiply yeah. it by 12.07%. The Bayes actually said that as well. However, the court, of course, when it looks at the law, can't find any reference anywhere to such a calculation ever being allowed. And you see some people justify it based on the entitlement divided by the averaging, but that assumes that everyone works every week, the same amount every week, then it would work. But if they don't and it fluctuates, it's broken. And that's what the court ruled. So suddenly Bayes and ACAS drop it overnight. So therefore you've got this element of, ah, oh, it was always wrong. 
what claims do we face? And then you had the government implement the three month, two year, but then you've got some cases where they're saying that doesn't necessarily always apply. So be careful. So it's become extremely complex, but those two rulings, because they're subject to appeal to the Supreme Court, don't mean you can do what you like, because the previous rulings are actually binding unless the yeah. Supreme Court changes it. Well, the, the Court of Appeal ruling in Brazil, that, that's still current law. That was heard at the Supreme Court last November. So we hopefully will have a decision on that shortly. But my advice, it, it's such a complex area. It, if you do think that you may be calculating holiday pay incorrectly, especially if you've got term time workers, we'll call them, then you know, seek specific legal advice in terms of, of your liabilities because th they could be high. Yeah. yeah, I'm really interested to see, you know, if we're supposed to have this single enforcement body come in, it's like whatever date that will be, I, d I don't know, but it's certainly something they're talking about. And and these guys are supposed to be enforcing, en enforcing the requirements around holiday pay. And I'm really interested to see what that audit looks like. Because I I can't imagine, you know, somebody gets paid in June on a monthly basis, they get regular overtime, they go on holiday from the 26th to the 30th of June. How are the single enforcement body going to tell us to include the pay from the prior to the 26th of June? So the 25th of June for the past 52 weeks, take out all the unpaid weeks and all of the other things with the data that sits in systems with the way that we operate. I, I really want to know how they're going to tell us to do it, if I'm honest, because it, it's just so difficult. It's well, so I mean, it's difficult. It really, really is difficult. And that's when you've got, you know, very good payroll software in place. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for the smaller employers? I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult, isn't it? <laughs> well, I just need to come to PPP and we'll all give them a hand. You know, we'll work through it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'll do that. What's the impact on, on maternity leave? Last bullet point here. Um, I think it's probably worth sure. uh, putting that into the foreground. Yeah, well, this one appears regularly in social media and discussion groups, see it all the time. Um, and again, I think it's uh, generally it's in potentially employer confusion. But uh, if they're operating a you can't carry your holiday forward, use it or lose it, which many employers do, including you know, my own to a certain extent, you, you've got to book your holiday and take it off because you're not carrying it over. We're seeing increasingly, or I'm seeing increasingly with the number of queries on the employment law, social media groups and the payroll uh, groups of people saying, I want to take my holiday, but my employer is saying I'm too late. I've lost it on returning from maternity. And there's an element of maternity doesn't follow the rule. It carries forward. So there's almost an element of using one law to not do something when another law requires you to. So with maternity, the holiday continues. You don't just lose it, it has to carry on. And, uh, and, and it's understanding the difficulties there because potentially if an employer denies it, you're into maternity discrimination area, which can be expensive. And just another point on that, Simon, not just maternity, other, other leave, family leave, shared parental adoption, etc. Well, I, I don't want to bring you back to the days of furlough, particularly. I think we've done that to death. But no. I know, and maybe I'm out of sync, I'm not a payroll professional, as you know, Simon, but for those that did accrue while on furlough and were able to, to carry over, is that still in play and something we still need to consider or, or we move past that period now? It is, but I think there's an element of confusion because some people were promised it and they're kind of being denied it. So I see that yeah. on social media as well now. So it's kind of, oh, yes, the law permits you to carry it forward. It was by agreement. There was no right to do that. But you could say, oh, don't worry about your holiday. You can carry it forward. But I've seen some employers then going back. Well, we didn't really mean it. Or even some saying, because there have been a couple of questions on some of the social media groups that were associated, where they're saying, can we actually go and pay it as if they had it whilst they're on furlough? But that runs into trouble with other obligations, because, of course, if an employer wants someone to take holiday, which they have a right to do, they have to give twice the notice. So how do you give twice the notice 
that you want them to take two weeks holiday in August 2019. Eventually, people yeah. paying holiday that's been unused anyway. You can't sell holiday under a certain amount and things like that as well. There's a couple of other considerations. Uh, sure. But we can probably cover a holiday topic on the cost of living aspect because I understand, mm -hmm. you know, we've got cases now where actually people are agreeing uh, to buy back holiday. As I was going to say, just a quick one on the maternity. So just sort of jumping back to that conversation about working together. One of the things that I always found was a bit of an issue with, with some of the communications on maternity leave and holiday was this person is returning on the 15th of March. Whereas actually what the, the agreement is, is she's returning on the 15th of March physically in person, but she's starting a holiday full pay from the 1st of January, for example. So then there's a phone call in January to the payroll team saying, I'm expecting full pay, where is it? And there's, there's sometimes a lack of understanding about the end of maternity leave and going on to holiday as part of what you accrued during maternity leave. So that's always one that's, that's worth double checking when somebody's coming back before you end up with that query coming through from the individual. Really good point. Really good point. Well, let's jump into the uh, the cost of living. While we're waiting for that slide to come up, we've had one question or a couple of questions come up that we're going to jump into first. Uh, the first is simple. I think we may have covered this just to make sure in case this individual joined late. Where, uh, where was the change to the current P45 processing documented? Was it the latest uh, in the latest HMRC update? Yes, it wasn't the latest. So it's not the June. It was the prior one. So mm. in, in my head, I have agent notice 96. Is it a, but I might have the numbers wrong, but I think it was the April and it is generally being adopted. So when we're at consultation groups and Sam and I would have been of those sorts of meetings, they're increasingly talking about not accepting the P45 after the first payment. Uh, predominantly because on the FPS since 2012, no starter information is reported after the first payment. E even if you accepted a late new starter checklist, if you said, oh, they, they didn't declare anything, so I reported them a C, zero T, or now they've turned up with an A declaration saying it's their only job, I'll put them 1257L, put that into the payroll. Of course, HMRC would be aware of that A declaration now. No, they won't because there is no facility to report it. Mm. Otherwise, if you did, you'd actually create another employment. So HMRC would think they now have two employments, one with a C, one with an A. So you can't. And I think it's just getting that timing. But the original proposal for um, FPS and RTI back in the old days, Sam, was that the P45 was eradicated altogether. Yeah, so it's been talked about for a while, and let's let's hope we get there eventually, eh? <laughs> but it was, it was in the agent notice, uh, not the employer bulletin, but the agent bulletin. So agents were told to not use uh, P45s after the first payment. Well, I've stormed, uh, I've I kind of stirred up the hornet's nest by mentioning that word furlough, which should be banned from the show, I'm sure, going forward. There is a question that relates back to COVID, so I'm going to ask it here, which is coming from Denise. It says, can you please remind me, during COVID, I seem to recall the need to request a PAYE settlement agreement annually was removed. Is, still, is that still the case? I'm not sure that's true, to be honest. I don't think there was any agreement to remove a PAYE settlement agreement. There may have been relaxations on various uh, taxation and uh, matters and, and reliefs, but uh, I don't remember a PSA saying you didn't need to do one. Was the Sam? Not from my knowledge. I'm glad they asked the question. Hopefully that helps. Uh, sure. my and uh, while we're on holiday pay pitfalls, then last question that's coming here from Nathan. It says, what is the recommendation then if we are currently paying? I, I had a feeling this question might come up. If we're currently paying the 12.07% holiday pay to our zero hour workers, will they have to declare when they're on holiday so we can do a calculation and pay it? Well, there's a couple of aspects, and uh, I'll say uh, Rachel's asked to be kind to her because she's had a difficult week. I think we all have a, had a difficult week this week. There's a there's a contractual position application and a duty of care aspect, but the other is because some pay this 1207 has rolled up holiday, uh, yeah. which of course was outlawed, outlawed in 2009, so it's not even recent. And others may, because, uh, you know, schools, you don't get your choice when your holidays, it's during school holidays, that's when you get your holiday pay. And, uh, and I know I've got children that have worked in the theatre 
or still work in the theatre, where they'll get their holiday pay when they have what they call dark. So the theatre's actually closed, there's no show. So they don't have any choice when they get it, they just get it. But that's in effect the employer notifying them that that's when their holiday is. But a zero hours worker, you do need to give them an opportunity to take it. And there are some aspects uh, under that case we talked about where it's a uh, working on assignment, so you're only considered in a worker on assignment. That's one aspect. Actually, 12.07% will actually overpay them yeah. in relation to their true entitlement. But if you haven't got that on assignment and they are just a standard zero hours worker, they're entitled to 5.6 paid weeks leave a year based on 52 week average and 12.07% isn't going to calculate it. So there's an element of review and decide what you want to do. But also, I think there's another aspect is actually look at your contractual position. Because look it at your contractual be position and yeah. review your working practices. Yes, because another aspect is if you don't actually pay someone for four weeks, you can legally treat them as a lever. You can retain them on the books and use them again, but in effect, your employment's ending. So the right to continuing holiday entitlement stopped so it's an element of what are they? But there's an element of what, why employ someone for a day a year and keep them on the books on that basis. You're actually giving them an entitlement of 5.6 extra days every year paid. Uh, a couple of comments that have just come in as well. Hope that answers the question for you, Nathan. Uh, we've just had, uh, Andrew's just mentioned that PSAs are now enduring, meaning you don't have to request one each tax year. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, let's move on then to uh, the cost of living. We've still got quite a bit to get through. It's amazing how fast uh, time flies. Let's start with bonuses. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions here. Thank you, everyone, for putting your questions into the uh, questions box. We'll get through them as we go, so please do keep them coming. Uh, let's kick off uh, then with uh, cost of living and bonuses. We had a good conversation off air about this. So, um, Pat, Sam, you'd like to kick us off? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, I don't think many of us have not heard about this topic for probably a couple of hours. <laughs> it's all over the news, everywhere that we're looking, everyone's talking about cost of living. One of the things that I know Simon and I would say we've seen a lot of on, on LinkedIn, number of firms, Rolls Royce being one and Socotech being another, there's a few different out there are putting in cost of living bonuses. So paying out various amounts. Again, I've also seen a select number of staff in some of them. I think Rolls Royce have opted for up to junior management level. I think other companies have done the whole of their workforce. So there's been different approaches to help people and employees with the cost of living increase. But I know one of the questions that's come out of that then for those individuals claiming universal credit is, well, what is the impact? I think at this point, I'll probably hand over to Simon because I know Simon will know this a lot more than, than I do. Yeah, sure. So, so yes, we've seen it. £1,000, £2,000 bonuses being paid off for cost of living. What does that impact? If the employees are the universal credit claimant, it will impact their entitlements. So there's an element of sometimes we have to think what it is. They will be better off, but they won't be 1,000 or 2,000 pounds better off. They may only be 450 pounds better off. And then you've got the tax on the uh, et cetera, because for every, well, actually it's the net pay amount, isn't it? So it's probably not that bad, but for the net, for every pound of net pay above the wage earnings allowance that you have for a universal credit claimant, they'll use, lose 55 pence of their benefit. So it's just to make sure that you, we realise that they won't have the benefit of all of the net amount from that 1,000 or 2,000, they'll only have 45%. And previously it would have been less, so it would have used to have only been 35% because it would have lost 65p, I'm saying that from memory, from their benefit. So they are better off, but probably not quite in the way that we think. Perfect. And we've got a, a, a point here that talks about fuel. This is always a, an interesting subject. People want to know if the government ultimately will increase the mileage allowance with the, the cost of fuel going up exponentially, as it seems to be. I know it's something we've covered on a previous PQT as well, but let, I wonder if we can have a quick chat about fuel and linking that to expenses as well, and, and, and perhaps what we're expecting to see in the future. 
Yeah, it's one we're regularly seeing, and we're seeing that a lot. They're putting a case to their employer that they need an increased amount. I think there's an element of uh, increased amount to what and what are we talking about? And it's something we've discussed a couple of times, isn't it, Nick? I mean, I operate my own cars. I don't have a company car, but uh, for, for the reason that the taxation is extortionate. Plus, I could get tax relief for my business mileage at 45 pence for the first 10,000 miles and 25 pence thereafter. And so that was quite a significant sum some years ago and it's whittling away it's not shrunk but i think there's an expectation of that sort of take home pay aspect that's gone but uh, maybe hmrc's intention was that you didn't have that take home aspect in the first place and i think that's where they argue that actually the rates had been over generous and they haven't reached a point of people making a loss we're probably just not making the tax saving we used to in comparison it's an interesting yeah. one isn't it because it's sort of one of those where previously i've always heard it well that's the wear and tear on my car the extra payment deals for the wear and tear on my car and now when you look at the cost of cars you know second-hand cars have gone it through the roof new cars are almost impossible to get hold of because there's chip shortage and, and i think by narrowing that gap and increasing the price of actually the vehicles that we use to get around in the first place. I do think there'll be a growing argument to, to look to move that at least a little bit if this increase continues. Yeah. And I believe, it, is it not until 2024 that they're talking about then we'll start to see a decrease in inflation rates? I'm so, sure I saw something like that on the news. So the 30, government, 24. <laughs> <laughs> Counter argument for you, Sam, only because we covered this in the previous PQT, which is quite interesting. And you can find some of these calculations if you go to thisismoney.co.uk. We do an interesting uh, article on this subject area. Now, interestingly, yeah. when this article was released, uh, the price of petrol had gone up to 151 per litre. I know we're well in excess of that now, but it was quite, this is when it came out when people were starting just to say, will prices be going up? And they were saying then, you know, uh, based on what we're getting back at the minute, is it covering it yeah. and how much does it need to go until you're, until you're worse off? The article says here um, that actually, if you got 40 miles per gallon based on the 151 price, the total cost of your fuel would come in at around £2,570, which means the current allowance would more than cover the cost of fuel, insurance and maintenance, because you'd get £5,750 for the first 15,000 miles claim back. So it more than covers it at 151. It then goes on to say, if you were to calculate it to work, to work out what it needs to go to, it says petrol prices would need to reach £3.50 per litre for your car mileage allowance to leave you in the red. So and that relates to private cars, doesn't it? And then it there's a calculator for company cars, and you could say, how's that coming along? Well, the rates were revised on the 1st of June, but if you look at the comparative value that they were using, uh, the petrol prices, et cetera, about £1.70 odd. So there could be that they're not £1.70 odd now. So that's changed rapidly. But the next review point is not due until the 1st of September. Now, there may be an element of thinking, should the government now start moving to a more rapid review because the company car driver may feel they're subsidising the company? I think also there's, um, to bring in Samantha's point and also um, yours earlier, Simon, there's an area here that says whether or not it covers it or not, we get used to our own ways of living right and the cost of yes. fuel prices we're still getting the same back in expenses but it's costing us more and therefore we're feeling it in the pocket whether or not it's more you know yeah. it, it's it's really um, and therefore i think employers do need to consider that that if you know it's an employment decision here to say well if the mileage rates aren't going to change maybe we need to look at your total remuneration to see where we can make sure you're not worse off so i think there's an employer obligation here to to think about it, particularly as you mentioned, Sam, if, if not looking at the you know inflation coming down for yeah. the years, I think it's really from my personal opinion is that employers need to be aware of how much is hitting people in the pocket to know what people what things can do. Yeah. And there's a trend in the US, Nick, of uh, employers starting to pick up the driving expenses of their employees. So there are things happening around the world where you think employers are taking in more of a role. How that would work here, I don't know, but. Uh, but uh, uh, was it manpower in North America are now, they call them gasoline subsidies. So they're actually paying people to get to work. Now let's have a talk about the living wage being brought forward from November to September. How will the impacts of that? 
the real living wage is announced in November normally. So it was announced in November 2021, and that has to be put in place for those people who are accredited real living wage employers by, I think it was May. Uh, so that deadline's only just gone at the very latest. What they've said now is because of the cost of living, they will be bringing forward the announcement of the new rate of pay, and that's going to be brought forward to September. So obviously we don't know what that will be yet, but I envisage with the, the calculation that they will apply, it will be quite a significant increase. And also thinking about um, minimum wage and national minimum wage, that's a significant gap now between the April increase that we're going to have as, as a statutory position and the September announcement that will come for those employers who are doing it voluntarily. I don't know if that will mean it will bring forward their um, normal implementation date because they do give employers time to implement that value. So we'll have to see what comes out of the September announcement when it when it comes to that. But certainly one that will have a big impact on payroll teams that are accredited minimum wage employers, real living wage employers. But there's an increasing number of uh, employers that are signing up. So uh, before the pandemic, even the numbers of employers committed to paying living wage was around 5,000. The current numbers committed to paying living wage during pandemic and coming out is 10,000. So it's actually doubled, uh, which is interesting. But whether this two months brought forward it will be a bit of a shock to them, I don't know. They have six months. So if they do apply it, the rise has to be implemented from the announcement uh, up to the latest March, but we don't know what date in September. They haven't announced the date mm -hmm. in September. They just said it be announced in September. It's usually the first weekend, isn't it? They tend to make the announcements. It's interesting, isn't it? That increase in employers. And I think a lot of that will probably link to all the discussions that we were having throughout the pandemic around well-being, around work-life balance. And, and ultimately part of that reward structure is then employers offering a great level of a reward and attracting employees into the business and now with this cost of living crisis hopefully that we won't start to see that number go down we'll continue to see that number increase but ultimately employers have got to weigh up that pressure on them and their costs versus obviously what they pay to their employees as well sure now i'm just going to give you a few things that i found online that may be helpful for businesses that can support their employees. These are things that already exist that you may not be aware of. So if you are a payroll manager, want to go and speak to your HR department or someone else to see if you can get these things implemented, it might be worth your while. The first is you can eat for free. So you can, businesses can provide free or subsidized meals to, to employees at your premises, as long as the food is provided equally to all employees or all of those working at a particular site. There's no taxable benefit for the workers to do that. Uh, there's a bus to work scheme, so providing free or subsidised transport for employees to get to work can help people who struggle to pay for fuel for their cars. We can talk about the full journey or part of it when employees are collected from a pickup point. The vehicle must be designed to carry at least nine passengers and the service must be available generally to any of your employees. So that's something to think about as well. There are, of course, small loans, so many employers will provide a season ticket loan to help employees pay in advance for their commuting costs. But interest-free loans up to £10,000 can also be provided for any other reason. The loan must be repayable and the loan agreement should be drawn up. And last but not least, uh, small gifts, just as directors can receive tax-free gifts worth up to £50 from their company, so can employees. So buying a school uniform for a worker's child or surprising them with a food hamper on their birthday, they can make a huge difference to, to families and to well-being and other things as well. And the £300 annual cap only applies to directors and their family members, not other employees. So a couple of things there to think about if you weren't familiar already. Um, let's jump in then to hot topics. I'm going I'm to come over to you, Rachel, to kick this off. Just before I do, uh, I've had a bit of clarification from the PSA question that came in earlier. It said, sorry, perhaps my question was not clear. It was based on the need to renew the agreement annually. Okay. Just for clarity, we do report and pay what is due, but yes, just looked and there is no need to renew annually. So just to clear yeah. that up. Okay. 
So I know the first bullet point here talks about Jersey businesses, but actually I'm going to ask Rachel to kick off with a slightly different element of the Hot Topic section, which is talking about new government legislation. So hot profess here, everyone, which relates to employment agencies supplying workers for industri- industries that are striking. Yeah, just, I guess, the bottom point, really. So today it has been announced that the government want to introduce legislation which will enable employment agencies, so recruitment agencies, I guess, to supply temporary workers and that will plug the staffing gap during industrial action. So this will be in response to strikes. Um, I know two teaching unions are looking to strike, obviously the rail workers, barristers as well. Um, how how easy it will be to supply agency workers, I'm, I'm not sure. The government have as well announced that they want to significantly raise the maximum damages that can be awarded in any action against a union arising out of unlawful industrial action. So the last time that that cap was raised was in 1982. These are significant changes in terms of of employee relations and it may be the direction of travel and it's something interesting to watch, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Point well made. And we've got a Jersey business has asked to pay back 10% of their COVID grants. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that, uh, Simon. Well, I do my best, but yeah, and some of them are squealing about it as well, aren't they? Because they're thinking it'll actually close them down. So Jersey businesses, I'm thinking they received about 200 million uh, of assistance from the Jersey uh, states of Jersey government, from my recollection. And uh, and of course, now they're being approached to see, would you like to give some of it back? And some of them are saying, <laughs> with what? and that could devastate them as a business. That's some of the reaction. However, a number of Jersey businesses are probably doing quite well and think maybe they should. The other aspect, I guess, is that goes into furlough, isn't it? And certainly in the early furlough days, we probably had a number of employers who thought they'd be seriously impacted. And they actually probably found that their profits went up uh, because of the changing nature and their costs went down. And so they actually did pay back. So I think we had values like 4.5 4.5 million being paid back to the government because they decided they didn't actually need the furlough assistance. Would we have similar in the UK? I guess that's the fear of that type of story is, would there be a point where there's some payback or recovery for grants received here? But uh, interesting times. Absolutely. And we've had a couple of uh, points come in with some of the others, which I think are really interesting. So. Uh, someone has popped in to say we're offering free children lunch meal bags during some holidays to all employees, which I think is fantastic. Mm-hmm. That comes from Anne. We've also had, and again, he said we've we've stopped the car park charges to encourage people to come back into the office. Some good things being being done there as well. Get back to a previous question. Here comes it from Eleanor. Can you give me the bulletin number? I don't know if you remember this, Simon. For the P45 change, uh, I can't see in either of the last two bulletins. I think you said it was 96. That might be. Is the uh, is the agent bulletin? And it's this year from April. I can give you the number. Uh, well, we're uh, doing give that. me a few minutes. That's right. It was a really interesting article that I, that I read and we were talking about off air, which is talking about getting privatised staff looking to return to the NHS, which I thought was really interesting. There was a, a big rally back in the, in relation to Calderdale Royal Infirmary in Halifax, where privatised health staff were rallying, demanding to be put back on the NHS payroll uh, because they wanted to be given pay parity. What were your thoughts on that article, Simon? I thought it was quite interesting. It's been sort of a subject I've thought was strange for some time because um, we talk about the um, historically, socially, the the creeping privatisation of the NHS, uh, quite often by various members of staff, where actually we find that they're actually self-employed, got involved in loan schemes, work for umbrellas, etc. And there's an, an even you've got it sometimes that some trusts only will employ staff via umbrellas and some of the cases that have come up. So I think there is an element of thinking, well, actually, uh, times may have been good on the outside. Maybe things are a little bit better on the inside and getting back to that parity. Plus, there have probably been a drop in the types of pay being received for additional workers. So, yes, interesting times. Yeah, I mean, one of the quotes I thought was quite uh... <laughs> highlights it quite well. And the quote that came out of the article, I'll put the article in the, in the chat note if anyone's interested here. It says, these are NHS workers, therefore they should quite frankly be paid NHS wages. Anything less is a slap in the face to people who form the front line of our fight against COVID. So, you know, it was quite a, 
uh, quite passionate article. I'll, I'll, I'll send it around because it is quite interesting. I think there's a relationship here, but also it links in quite nicely to talking about the tax avoidance list and umbrellas potentially. Because take, take the floor again, Simon here, because there's some interesting uh, uh, list that's been released. Yeah, sure. So the going back to the P45 question, it's in Agent Update 96, uh, and there's a section called Tell HMRC about a new employee. And it says, oh, I'll quote it, if you use starter checklist to add the employee onto your payroll records and you receive the P45 after you've submitted your first full payment submission, you do not need to update the previous paid tax or tax code on your payroll software, only update the student loan details. And we've, there's also been other consultation where they're saying, wait for HMRC to tell you what it is, don't use it after the initial. So it's agent update 96. I've just put it into the chat for everyone. Kindly shared by Emma Broughton. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, she's yes. mentioned as well, you can use the starter checklist to add the employee onto your payroll records and you receive P45 after you've submitted the first full payment submission. You do not need to update the previous pay tax or tax code on your payroll software. Only update student loan details of the big book. I think that's what Samantha said earlier on in the, uh, the conversation as well. I've also just dropped into the chat as well the link to those interested in that NHS article. Um, let's go back to the umbrella and uh, avoidance list. Sorry. Um, uh, and it kind of falls a little bit, maybe with the NHS, because I think NHS workers were trapped in some of these some years ago in the loan schemes. But now the HMRC are naming organisations and they tend to be under the umbrella. I'm not saying all umbrellas are bad, but some of them seem to be. So they had uh, best employment services where the director has been banned. In fact, I think one was sent to prison who filtered it through an Isle of Man company and then sold off aspects of the assets of a loan to Anguilla, which would never be repaid. But we already know the uh, reason there. And another one is uh, HMRC has named Peak PAYE Limited as a tax avoidance promoter and urges individuals to withdraw from using it. You probably find they're still trading, but they're saying it doesn't work and you'll end up with a large tax bill. So it's just to let people know that uh, the HMRC are starting to name uh, certain organisations and saying don't get avoid, uh, involved in the avoidance because they don't work and you will end up paying significant amounts of money. That goes along with the other consultation that was announced, I don't think it was yesterday, but the day before on the tax avoidance market. And Sam knows that we've been quite interested on this because we don't want payroll to get trapped into the uh, stamping down on the tax advice market because it would be problematical. And I, generally, I think payroll is not the problem, but tax advice is a very broad term. And what does that mean? But the, as which described them, the rebate retrobates. So uh, you'll have seen them if you've been on social media, get attacked by them, or certainly did a few weeks back of claim your marriage allowance, claim your marriage allowance, claim your marriage allowance, claim your home from working allowance, uh, et cetera, where they've implemented assignment arrangements. What an assignment arrangement means is every tax refund will go to that company forever even if they don't do any more work for you and taking uh, disproportionately high fees. So to actually claim your marriage allowance will probably take you 10 minutes yourself online if you've got the personal tax account. It might take you half an hour to take the personal tax account. But once you're there, you can claim your own ta marriage tax allowance. Whereas these companies have uh, been shown to be charging four to 500 pounds to do it. And it's not clear. Uh, when you sign up. So that consultation has just launched on the development of that. But I think there's an element of just be careful. Sometimes there are too good to be true stories out there. Uh, quite often they are too good to be true. And uh, and the vulnerable seem to be the ones that end up being really punished. Yeah. I'd like anything as a recruiter, It's um, I'd recommend anyone that's using umbrella companies just shop around because sometimes if they're offering lots of lovely incentives to join that's probably one of the first things that i'd be wary of it, it can be a little bit of a um uh, unknown going into that market space so you know if you can get referrals and recommendations or you know people that are working with ones that, that, that give you a good service that's probably the way to go rather than necessarily the one that's promising you the world um, i put a couple of links in the uh, in the chat for people of some of the recent cases that have gone through that have been reported on as uh, so feel free to have a look at those is in your leisure and uh, now we may have actually covered the last point slightly in rachel's um talk at the start but is there anything we need to add to the transport strikes and payment for missing work 
Probably not. I think the other aspect that I think was of interest to me, and I don't necessarily know the answer, Nick, is if I'm due to go to work and I can't get there, what's the implication for me? So I'm not on strike. I just can't get to the office. Good communication with your manager, I think, on that, Simon. Might be asked to take annual leave. Can you work from home? All, all the uh, usual criteria, I think, but I mean, I'm not going to comment on the strikes, but I guess, it, you know, it's unfortunate for workers that want to go to work and can't because of the strikes. So, and especially yeah. if they have to then use annual leave that um, they don't want to. From a payroll point of view, it's capturing that data as well. You know, how do you get visibility? If you've got a time and attendance system in place, it makes it slightly easier sometimes, but not everyone will have that. So having visibility of who is in, who isn't in, the reason for and what the decision's been made about payment or holidays or anything for, for that individual. It's a difficult one as well because it, it's often things like this that then escalate because one individual had to take annual leave, one got paid, so uh, a business mm -hmm. decision. We, we do have a bit of notice of when the strikes are, so I think it needs to be made at a higher level on what, what the outcome is for you, Simon, if there's a rail strike and you can't get to work. Oh, Simon's got an electric car, he's got no excuses. He can get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the roads are all blocked now with all these people that are having to drive. Yes. Oh, okay. It's it's interesting in, in the eighties, certainly part of the bank, uh, they'd have emergency contingency plans of coaches. How viable that is these days, I don't know. But in those oh. days, I guess a rail strike was not an unusual thing. Yeah. Well, we've got one last point before we close off today's uh, PQT, which comes in from Anne, just saying, going back on the NSD or P45, uh, not being on the first FPS, if P45 operated the following month, does this get reported on the next FPS? No, it doesn't. The prior employer values don't get reported on the FPS at all. So it impacts the tax calculation. And I think this is probably one of the reasons they're finding, because lots of employers appear to be getting uh, determination 80 penalties, where the tax liability of the individual is assigned to the employer uh, because they've operated the wrong tax code. And the reason being there is, if you read CWG2 on the old version, if you'd received a tax code from the tax office, you wouldn't be allowed to operate the P45 anyway. So all they're really saying now is just don't bother. If they haven't given it to your first payday, then don't bother using it, apart from the student loan, because it might oh, indicate their liability there. Cycle. To close it off, Sam started with that student loan point. We're going to finish there as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today on PQT. Thank you so much for Sam for her, completing her first PQT with the panel. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Rachel. We look forward to seeing you next episode on the 22nd of July. Registration will open soon, so please do sign up for that. But thank you, everyone, and we look forward to bringing you the next uh, PQT on the 22nd of July. Have thank a great you. day. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment. If you need help with a current payroll vacancy, then please get in touch with Nick and his team. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels. Till next time. <laughs>